yeah. hold those thoughts. Yeah. Hey, you guys. Well, I don't know if you could hear us chatting behind the scenes, but that that was just a little conversation that we're having before we get started. Hello, you guys out there in the world. Lyle, uh, who else we got in here? TSX Agility, is that what it is? I, I'm Portland, Oregon, awesome. We're heading that way pretty soon, actually. Uh, going on a road trip next week to Montana, and then we're going to cut over to Idaho and a little... I think we're going to hit a little south of Portland. And cool. uh, great to have you guys with us. Montreal. Hello, Lyle. Okay. Mekong Delta. That always blows my mind. Uh, what time is it there right now? That's... I don't have my chat. I don't have my chat today because I'm in a different room and I'm, I'm using my iPad. So I can't see where everybody's coming in from. But Mekong Delta, that's like the coolest place in the world. That's amazing. Okay, we're going to have to get some photographs from you guys. Terry from Dallas, right on. All right, well, let's All get right, this. All right, Dallas. 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 I'm, not, I'm not bagging on you, but Dallas versus Mekong Delta. I, live, <laughs> I spent 25 years in Texas, so I can, I can say with confidence, if I had to choose, maybe i go Mekong Delta, but, but Dallas, I still feel you. We Big feel D. You. So we've got Dean in Shoreline, Washington. That must be beautiful. Yeah, that and sounds nice. Cindy, I don't know where you're. DE, Denmark. All right. Wow. There we I go. I love it. We're all over Denmark. the place. Denmark. Okay. Toronto. Paul. Hey, Paul. And Wales. Hey, I, last time I went to Wales, I went to see my old friend Van Morrison. He was doing a concert there. I had to drive from southern uh, Essex, uh, England, over to Wales. It was quite a drive. And uh, that, that was. That sounds awesome. That was kind of cool, yeah. The food was really weird, though. I got to tell you, they they served some strange. <laughs> On the way, I wasn't. I'm not knocking Welsh food. This was this was the English fare, in in you know truck stops. It wasn't wasn't very exciting. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, no, not known for for the truck stop. Really, truck stop truck stop cuisine worldwide is questionable. It's if not I had the to... greatest in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, listen, let's get this party started here. Let's not use that screen. Okay, you guys, it's Mark Silver. You know me. I'm going to uh, let you know that this episode is brought to us by our friends at Bay mm -hmm. Photo. I love these guys. Here's some specials. You can do wood prints. I think we've been talking about that for a while, 20% off. We want you to print stuff. Okay, you don't have to use a wood print, but this is what they've got on special right now. And you'll get 25% off on your first order. Whatever you do, print something. Put Friends. it on the wall. Make, make it into a book. Make it into cards. Make prints. There's Dan with his prints. Let's bring Dan on and see. Wow, mm -hmm. check that mm -hmm. out. Yeah. That the same is... book I had last time, still working on it. It's got built-in prints, and then I've been adding prints as well. I got up into Colorado last week in the van, so I made some images from that trip. I'm printing every single day. And by the way, those are the world's worst prints. They're cheap inkjet prints, and, and I have like a 10-year-old scanner printer, so you don't need anything fancy. You don't need anything fancy, but you do need to print stuff. Get it off your computer. Get it off your phone. Make it into a print. And we have with us a legendary Dan Milner, creative evangelist for Blurb. Dan! We're going to talk about five things that went wrong, you made mistakes with, and five lessons you wish you'd learned. Over to you. Yeah. I mean, when, when you asked me about this and I thought, okay, things I wish I knew, that, that took me a half a second to figure that out. So I went for a bike ride and I came up with some things. In terms of mistakes, there, I have made so many mistakes. It's, it's a real – the hardest part was trying to figure out where to start because – I think we all do. I think mistakes are, uh, but but there's there's something I notice, and I'm going to start with things I wish I knew. But talking about mistakes in particular, there's a big change that's happened. I think, and it's global, and it's in our society. And that is when back in the day, if I go back to when I started in photography, late '80s, early '90s, pre-internet, you know, pre being able to share everything instantaneously. When I got into photography school, failure was sort of the one of the first discussions that we had was with yeah. the faculty about the fact that w the vast majority of what you did was not going to work and that that was perfectly fine. And so it, I don't see that kind of same thing now because most of the time, whatever we're doing is immediately going out onto the Internet in front of a global audience. And people are yeah. a little bit less prone to say, oh, I've totally botched this, you know, because you're trying to present this facade of what your life is actually like. 
So I will, um, there's nothing wrong with making mistakes. And uh, a lot of photographers I know that are t more talented than I are, are very quick to tell you that if you're not failing in, on a routine basis, you're probably not pushing things hard enough. So I all think right, one, of the th one of the things that's happened, Dan, is that the stigma of making a mistake making a mistake has been removed and flipped around because there's actually power in a mistake. You learn from it. And if you don't make a mistake, oh, yeah. you're not doing anything. You're not trying new stuff, right? Well, I mean, I look back at the books I made when I first started using Blurb, like in 2006, 2007, and they're just occasionally I would get lucky and make something good. But for the most part, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know anything about page design. I had one design class during my entire college life of four years. I had one, and I was using a T-square and tracing paper. We didn't have computers. So by the when it came to Blurb and all of a sudden they're like, here's a piece of software. You can build a book. I didn't know what to do. I was like, oh, page wow. one, I'll just put a giant photo there. There's no front matter. There's no back matter. There's no editing and sequencing. I just was like splat, splat, splat. And I look right. back on those books like they're terrible. But at the same time, I looked at them and said, these don't look like what I'm what I think photo books are supposed to look like. I better get better and figure out, like, why does Jill Perez book look one way and my little books look look something totally different? I need to fix that. But all right, let's talk about five. Yeah, things I let's wish dive I in, dive in. The first thing I wish I knew was the winning lottery ticket numbers, um, and that applies all the time. No, I'm kidding. That's, I know. Uh, that's Can you not give those to one. us right now? Yeah, that would be nice. The first thing I wish I knew was I wish I – this goes back to the early 90s. I wish I knew that digital was coming so that I could have really taken the time to appreciate – what it was like to come up in the analog era. And when yeah. I say analog era, there's a couple of elements that are key. One is the time required to do analog photography, which is pretty extensive. The pace at which you do analog photography, because at the time, I wasn't even scanning everything. I was processing film and printing in the darkroom. That was the only option I had. Yeah. And also the, the physicality of analog in terms of being in the darkroom and being on your feet all day working with your hands and even making prints in the darkroom if you've never done that it is a very physical experience i mean it you're is. kind of you're going like this and you've got little dodging things and burning things and it's like this weird dance that you're doing in the darkroom it was the only thing we knew and and even in like 92 93 when the rumors when kodak was like rumoring that this new technology was coming Instead of like saying, OK, that's the future. I need to take a, a second to appreciate what I have. I just I just took it for granted. And I look back on it now and I'm like, wow. It, the, and I think the primary point that I miss was the pace, the pace of life and the pace of analog photography was much, much, much slower. Yes. Than digital. And, and that pace translated into every aspect of being a professional photographer. As soon as the te digital technology arrived, every editor, every art buyer, every assignment just shortened <clears throat> exponentially. You had people like, we need it now, we need it right now, we need everything now, it has to be now. Even though they didn't need it, it just, in everyone's mind, it was this monumental shift over and I never took the time to appreciate analog. So that was the one thing I wish I knew. Isn't that amazing? Uh, no. Also, I mean, yeah, it's it's I, I could also say the same thing in terms of moving from uh, analog albums, phonograph records, LPs yeah. to I was so quick to jettison that stuff and and go, OK, we're, I'm going to CDs. This is a much higher quality. I completely was brainwashed by that, which is totally untrue. Anyway, that was my yeah. that's a different genre, well, but it, my mistake. It's funny because that's a good point. I was working on a project in Italy once and I was renting a house in the country. And uh, at night there was a turntable in the house that I rented and there were like six albums. And one of them was an early Dylan album. And I was shooting film and my wife was shooting film and a third photographer had switched over to digital. And I saw immediately the lifestyle change that was digital. So every day when we would get back to the farmhouse, I would just hang out and my wife would hang out. I would write my journal. We would go for walks. And the other photographer who was digital sat at their computer the second they got to the farmhouse all in, late into the night, backing up and archiving and exporting right. and doing all this stuff. And I just remember looking and thinking, I don't think that looks that fun to me. But I remember going over to the turntable and putting on a Dylan album and – 
listening to the Dylan album and realizing like halfway through a side, I'm like, I don't really like this song. But in my head, I thought Dylan put this song in order on this album That's for right. a reason. That's so right. I'm supposed to listen to this A side through to B side through. And there is a there is an overarching message here that he is trying to get across. And even though this may not be my favorite song, I need to listen to it because it's a piece of the puzzle. So, yeah, that's a it's a really good point. All, All right. right. Point number two. I wish I knew how hard professional photography was going to be so that I could have shot more and worked harder. Um, being a professional photographer did not get easier over the years. It got more difficult. And. What got more difficult was not the actual making of the photographs. You get better. You're in training. It's like an athlete working out. It's like a tennis player spending four or five hours on the court every day. You will get better. Yeah. But what got more difficult was the business playing field and the business of photography. And you can get distracted. And especially and a, a really good photographer out of Seattle named Stuart Isaac was uh, – I saw this on LinkedIn yesterday. He, he said, I always tell young photographers – you not one you have to shoot all the time but two you have to shoot especially when you're not getting any work because that personal work that you make can come full circle at some point down the line so stewart spent a lot of years in asia and he has huge bodies of work on cambodia thailand japan china etc and so he uh you know i was like that's a really good point i should have shot more and i should have worked harder than i did and it wasn't like I was slumping off. I mean, you know me, I'm pretty, pretty motivated and pretty driven, but I could have done more and I, I should have, and I should have known that. Yeah. I hear you. Uh, point number three, I wish I knew that gear has very little to do with anything other than your base decision of what kind of work you're trying to make. Right. So when I was very, very, very early in my photo career, I had, you know, two cameras and I thought the cameras and the bag and the vest and like what kind of film I was using and all the nonsense that you get wrapped up in. And it's so much easier to fixate on like, okay, I have two Nikon FM2 bodies and one is chrome and one is black and I'm going to put a little piece of red tape on the top of one and that's going to remind me that it's the color camera. It's all the nonsense that yeah. young, young photographers do that you look back on and you're like, you're an idiot. Why would you do any of that? It doesn't really matter. The, the equipment matters in the sense that you say, okay, my base decision of what I want this project to look like, maybe it's a color six by six, right? I want yeah. square, I want color, and then you do it and you move on. But it's so easy to get distracted down that path because it's a lot easier to do that than it is to go make good photographs. And so, so are you going to sit at your computer and do research, which is challenging, or are you just going to fixate on gear? And again, it's easy. It's lazy. You say to yourself, oh, this is great. Now it's like I have a new camera coming to me here, uh, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, and it's not a really. It's a technically it's a still camera, but it's more of a motion camera that's coming, and um, and I, you know it's coming, and then I'll probably have to buy another new Fuji here in the coming weeks. For whatever reason, I don't get like this camera's coming, and it, and I need this camera because I'm doing a lot more motion now. And this will give me a certain style of motion that I can't do right now because I don't have anything that's stabilized. So, and I don't want to use a gimbal because they're too bulky and I'm carrying enough stuff as it is. So yeah. I have this new camera coming and I'm super appreciative. The camera's coming from Sony and I'm super appreciative to the folks at Sony who are, you know, got me this camera, but there's not like this intense fascination with the device itself. What I'm fascinated by is what I'm going to do with that camera. It, exactly. It's a tool. Yeah, because, it, and, you know, like yeah. we have a little DJI with a with a gimbal on it and it's a tool that you can easily use to capture what you're what you're going out to get. You know, I mean, that's what it's all about. What tool are you going to use? Yeah, there's this big gap in the kind of coverage that I can do, kind of motion I can create, because I don't have a stabilized body. And Fuji only makes one stabilized body, really, which is the X-T4, which I probably will end up getting because my twos are getting old and one of them is starting to act funky. So that's probably – but at the same time, I'm like – I don't – it's like buying a computer. Do I get excited when I get a new computer? No. I just in my head say, oh, my oh, God, man. this is going to be more efficient than my last one so I can yeah. spend more time away from this device. I mean, that's, in some weird way, that's how it works. The better <laughs> the device, the less time you have to spend with it. I hear All that. right. Point, point number uh, four. I, I'd like to say one other thing on that. Yeah. Uh, 
jumping in here. The I think that Jared. another big point of that is it can be so easy for somebody to look at the photos made by other people and be like, well, I can never make photos that good because I don't have the equipment. Oh, yeah. Not realizing yeah. that. And so, like, they're limiting themselves and they don't even try to yeah. get better at taking photos with the equipment they have because they don't think it's good enough to make good photos. So, you know, there, there's even that part of the equation on why did this concept. Michael, why did Michael Jordan sell so many? Why did, why did Nike sell so many Air Jordans? You know, if you if yeah. you had his shoes, maybe you could do the same dunks that he was doing, right? Look, I used to, the, 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 Jared, that's a great point. And to me, the group that jumps out is, uh, so I used to assist for two guys who were really good sports photographers. I used to assist for a guy named Rick Rickman, who won a Pulitzer in 84 for the coverage of the Olympics in LA. And Rick could shoot pretty much any sport out there, right? And he was the middle distance runner in college. He was a good athlete. He's a tall, lanky dude that was pretty, pretty, you know, fast to keep up with. And then I assisted for Peter Reed Miller, who was a Sports Illustrated photographer who also did work for co corporate work for Adidas and brands and stuff. And so and I was a terrible I love sports, but I was a terrible sports photographer. And we would sometimes go to these these events and I would, you know, Rick would say, here's a whatever, 300 or 400 millimeter lens. Go ahead and shoot. Well, yeah, you can give me all the equipment in the world. I can't I still can't shoot sports. Right. And the guys at Sports Illustrated were amazing to me because and the guys who shot baseball in particular were fascinating because you think, oh, if I had a 600, I could shoot baseball. Well, the truth is those guys who are really good are sitting in the dugout and they know the teams. They know the players and the pitchers and they know the strategy. Yeah. So they're like, oh, it's the bottom of the ninth, one out. They got a left-handed left-handed pitcher who throws a slider to a right-handed batter. He's going to hit to right field. And so they are setting up because they're able to study the game. It has nothing to do with the equipment. If you don't know the game, who cares what equipment you have? So it's a great point. I, I realized immediately I'm like, I'm never going to shoot golf. I'm never going to shoot tennis and this stuff because I suck at it. I, I love watching tennis. I love football. But I'm just not good at it, and you could give me the best equipment in the world, and I'm not going to come back with the goods. All right. All right. So uh, point number four is I wish I knew to expand outside of photography. So I made a big mistake, which was when I discovered photography and I got serious about it, I immediately went all in. And I took the rest of my personal life, and I just forgot about it. I forgot about every single thing I did before I became a photographer. I used to do a lot of bird hunting. I used to do fishing. I grew up in a rural family. We were did a lot of bird hunting and fishing. I was a cyclist. I was I was hiking outdoors. I loved geology. I was collecting rocks. I was doing all this stuff. And it just was like this clean break. <laughs> and I thought, I thought, oh, if I'm gonna be a photographer, I have to go all in. And I'm just gonna that's all I'm gonna do and all I'm gonna talk about. And I thought about this the other day is I had this conversation with my mom, and this is going to sound terrible, and I'm not bagging on my mom, but I thought it was hilarious. So we're talking about politics with my mom, and she's on one side of the spectrum, and I'm, I'm sort of on the other side. And so we're talking, and, she, and I'm talking to her about propaganda versus news. And I said, Mom, you have to know where to get news online because a lot of what you see now is propaganda from, from both sides, and you have to learn to navigate and triangulate where it's, it, news is coming from and stories and then look at the sources. And she goes, well, how do you know all this? And I said, well, what did I study in college and what did I spend the first 10 years of my career doing? And she goes, I have no idea. And I go, I go journalism. Like I studied journalism. And I think the reason she had no idea is that I wasn't a very interesting character during that time because the <laughs> only thing I was doing was photography. The only thing I talked about, thought about, did, I stopped everything else and I just did photography and it's just not smart. It's not smart. I should have, I wasn't reading like I should have been. I wasn't researching what was happening in the rest of the world outside of like, where could I go to get pictures and do a story? I was boring. I just yeah. wasn't a very interesting dude. I think now I'm probably, I mean, there's probably plenty of people who know me that would beg to differ, but I think I'm a lot more interesting now than I was back then. And the relevance it's not that I'm when I those rare times when I get in the field to actually make pictures with intention. I'm serious about making pictures with intention, but it's so few and far between those chances to get into the field. I haven't been in the field in over a year. 
And so if I was only talking about photography and doing this, my wife would have probably left me 20 years ago. And so <laughs> I, should, I should have been more well-rounded, really. That's a huge, important part to me. The people that I find interesting now are people who are far more well-rounded. They might do photography and they might be professional photographers, but when you talk to them, you can cover a range of topics. Yeah, I hear you. That was number five, right, Dan? That you was said, four. I thought we haven't we hit five points. Well, I can I can throw a bonus one in. Okay, go go for it. Uh, let me see if this even makes sense. Uh, oh, I wish I would have known that I could have been better off if I had used my college education on something related but unrelated to photography. So I studied my major is in photojournalism, and I have minors in Spanish and anthropology. If I was to do this again, I might flip that. I might major in anthropology and minor in photography because the playing field has changed. The business of photography, the industry, et cetera, it's much, much harder now. You could study business with a minor in photography. I don't know if I would go so all in on the photo thing. I wish I would have known that at the time because the anthropology and the Spanish in some weird way have been just as important as the photo education. I think. Spanish has, in particular, especially in America, there's so many opportunities for utilizing Spanish. Look at the state I live in. I live in yeah. New Mexico. It's a, it's a Spanish-speaking state amongst other languages. You know, English is, uh, is on the list as well, but you have all the Native American languages. But Spanish is a huge part of life here. I spent 25 years in Texas. I lived in a city that was three-quarters Latino. And so Spanish was huge. And anthropology is the study of human behavior, basically. And when you're in the field doing human-based documentary projects, you better be able to read the people around you. True and the anthro true anthropological true. society and the, the amount of data that you can study is just endless. I mean, I had the most remarkable uh, instructors in anthropology at the University of Texas in Austin. They were incredible. They, I had these instructors that I still think about probably on a monthly basis, something will remind me of one of these instructors. I had this uh, an instructor named Robbie Davis Elizabeth Floyd, who was a birth specialist who <laughs> traveled all over the world and studied how women gave birth around the world. And I'm in this class thinking, oh no, this is gonna be the longest semester in history. And it was one of the best classes I've ever had. I had a guy who lived in his van in Mexico, with, lived with the La Condon Indians. There's only 20, 250 of them left. And he had traveled, you know, and spent a decade living in a van in Mexico and then came back and taught us about all the tribes of, of Central and South America. And I was like, wow, these people are great. So I would have branched out and maybe shifted my education. All right. All right. Should we move on to the mistakes? Let's do that. So now I think one thing before you do that, we can almost yeah. summarize those first five points, which is broaden your horizons, you know, Ansel yeah. Adams was first before he became a photographer he was a concert pianist and he was studying to become a professional pianist he w was also an avid naturalist and environmentalist and used photography as a vehicle for that he might have had a million other interests but i know at least those three that he he used to round out his life you know it wasn't just obsession like you said with photography he was rounding things out. Henry Cartier-Bresson more or less left photography, right, to go back to yeah. his uh, pen and ink drawings and painting just because that was his another, you know, I think he conquered photography, so he thought, well, I'm going to go back to something I really love as well. So I think your point is let's be not two-dimensional in our lives. Let's be multi-dimensional and yeah. bring that into our photography as well. All right, mistakes. And mistakes yeah. come in many sizes, both small ones and uh, large ones. Um, speaking of assisting, I once was standing on a rock ledge assisting someone in uh, Arizona outside of Phoenix, South Mountain Park, just south of the city, and the entire rock ledge I was standing on snapped off. Ow. And I went down this cliff face and bounced off of a black, about a three-foot-tall black cactus that had spines like this that embedded in my whole left shin – and uh, and my foot froze in place because the tendons like when the thought the spines went in and like stuck and my foot was like this and I couldn't move my foot like this. And I ended up in the ER and they had to, and, and they, oh, by the way, cactus spines don't show up on an X-ray. So they had to take a pair of pliers into the holes that they could see and dig around. It was awesome. 
That was uh. a minor mistake. And, I, and that's not entirely on me because I didn't know the ledge was going to break off. But the first mistake I made, this was kind of hilarious. I was at UT Austin. I, had, I was almost ready to graduate. And I studied photojournalism, right? Because I didn't take the time to look around at the rest of the, of the course offerings. I didn't realize there was a major called photography that was in the art department. <laughs> so I, I end up in photojournalism because I think it's the only thing. And photojournalism is all about rules and about pseudo ethics and what you can do and can't do. And you're framing things and everything is very linear and structured and very journalistic, which is fine. And it's interesting. And I do love journalism, so it fit me pretty well. But I should have studied photography. I should have studied photography and still done documentary work. But I should have gone in the art department because the art department, what I figured out about a semester before I graduated, was the art department was wide open. The art department was about conceptual, put it this way, conceptual work was not frowned upon. So I could have still done documentary work, but I would have had so much more freedom in the photography department than I did in the photojournalism department. Yeah. And journalism, journalism was already starting to die, the photo journal, the newspaper world. And I just didn't know. I was so rushed. I didn't take I didn't look around. And I met someone in the photo department, in the photography department, and they told me about the kind of project they were working on. And I was like, oh, my God. What did I do? I like shot myself in the foot by taking this, you know, journalism path, which is pretty much on the way out. And it's all about rules and structure and this and that. And I could have had this like wide open blank canvas in front of me. So that to me was a was a, a shock and, and definite mistake because I because studying photojournalism narrowed my mindset about photography. And it took me 20 plus years to unwind that mindset and realize that things like art photography and conceptual photography are not foo-foo styles yeah. of photography. They are incredibly interesting and in some ways far more transcendent today than photojournalism is. And so that to me was a mistake. I shouldn't, oh. have, shouldn't have done that. All right. Mistake number one. But mistake number two was I did not collaborate with anyone until 30 years later why on earth I was not collaborating with writers is beyond me or designer anything. I mean, I just didn't, I was so myopic about my own work and my own career. And we've talked about this before. I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago when we talked is I became a better human being the moment I quit being a professional photographer because yeah. I was able to take my foot off the gas and stop thinking about myself and take a look around at everyone else and say, hey, what's what's Mary doing? What's Sarah doing? And look around and go, oh, hey, I, maybe I should have like reached out to these folks. I didn't collaborate. That is a monumental mistake because so much of the best work I see is collaboration. Yeah. And the, the simple fact is I'm never going to be a world-class writer or designer or book layout person. And so if I'm going to make something world class, I better partner with somebody who Boy, is. Boy, that is and, so uh, true, Dan. Yeah. No, it's it's, like, it's it's knowing. I mean, my I, honestly, my whole career has been based on collaboration. And that's how you and I met. I mean, otherwise, yeah. I, I wouldn't have reached out to you. But that point about working with others, like, I don't know how to design a book. I'm not a designer. I don't, either. I don't even want to try. But I know I can collaborate with a designer. I, you know, they pick the font, they pick the, the layout on the pay, all these things that could go unnoticed that, like you mentioned at the beginning of the show, it, it makes the difference between a really professional piece of work and something that's like, what's this, right? Yeah, Collaboration. I had, I had a guy reach out this morning, a young kid from Germany, and he wrote me an email and said, hey, I love your films on YouTube, but can you do a film about uh, archiving, digital storage? He said, my, my Lightroom catalog is at two terabytes and it's not working anymore. And like, what the heck am I going to do? And I wrote him and I said, you are talking about the white elephant in the professional photography space, which is archiving. You go to a trade show and bring up archiving and you are public enemy number one. Nobody wants to talk about it because nobody has a good solution. 
and everyone downplays how complicated and expensive it is and everyone just will throw out things like oh just put it in the cloud and i'm like well i have 50 terabytes of of data how am i going to get on the cloud oh you have too much you can't possibly have 50 terabytes oh you're an, you're an egomaniac why would you have 50 terabytes you shouldn't keep all that you know all this like cockamamie stuff that yeah. you're hearing and i'm like i know people that have way more than 50 terabytes so i wrote this kid back and i said look i'm not the guy but I sent an email to Peter Crow earlier today and I said, Peter, let's collaborate on a film. You know, you cut a section of film, send it to me and I'll do a little me sitting here talking about how you and I know each other and why I'm not going to give you information about how to archive your work. But Peter wrote the digital asset management book amongst among others. And if I, when it comes to like archiving my digital files, he's the first guy that I reach out to. And I said, look, you've got the books, you have the knowledge, you have the history. Let's do a film together and put it out. So I'm going to collaborate with him because I know that there's so many people out there that are going to say, oh, my God, I don't know Peter Crow. I didn't know he had a digital asset management book and walks me through how to do like this mind blowing archive. And so that's it. I got to collaborate because I'm not you don't want my knowledge. And my you don't want me telling you how to use Lightroom or telling you how to archive anything. Got it. Point number three. I did not listen to that inner voice in my head uh, for the first probably 10 years of my career there was that little book some would call it a devil some would call it an angel on my shoulder that was just shaking its head at me and saying you're not doing what you know you're supposed to do you're doing what other people expect of you and so i spent 10 years of my career shooting pictures for other people the first 10 years and i didn't shoot my pictures because i shot what i thought was expected of me and that was just a my is it not a I can't say it was a waste of 10 years because I made my living as a photographer and I did a lot of assignments and I got some accolades and praise from people that said, hey, you're doing a really good job, whatever. But in my head, I was like, this is not really who I am. This is not what and, and when that haunts you for 10 years, that's a long time to marinate with those thoughts. Right. When you're sitting alone at night and what really did it for me was 1997. So I shot from about 1990 to about 1997 and I was shooting other people's work. And I looked at my portfolio at the end of 1997 and there was not a single image in it that was mine. Even though I shot those pictures and those pictures ran in magazines and for corporate clients and whatever, I looked at it and I said, this is not even my work. Like, I don't even like this. I don't identify with this. These are not good photographs. I'm getting all this work, but they suck. And so I quit. And when I quit and took four years of working for Kodak, that was the first time I realized, all right, I finally figured out what I'm doing. I finally figured out when I pick up a camera who I am, and I should have done that from day one. And what that would have done was prolonged the difficulty of making a living, but it would have made me a better photographer. And I would have had probably more of a portfolio from that era because the first 10 years of my career, there's nothing left of because nothing was mine. Yeah. And so I should have listened to that voice and, and I didn't. So I hear that, that voice talks to me all the time now. Some would say that's a problem, but uh, I like it. We've come to we've come to peace with one another. <laughs> all right, Dan. Yes, you've got to follow that, you know, whether you call it your inner voice, inner compass, whatever, being true to your own self, being true to your goals and your passion. You have to include that into your mix. And I agree with yeah. you. I agree with yep. you. The commercial work that I've done, I mean, it's like, it's for, as you said, it's for somebody else. It's not something I'm going to ever use in my own portfolio. I might show it if I'm trying to get a similar job, but yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't, it's never going to be printed. It's never going to be used in anything that is important to me. And that's really <laughs> important. You know, we I, gotta, knew I, I knew I was doomed making a living in photography because I remember I got a job for a, how would you describe this company? I got a job for, it was a commercial shoot for an appliance manufacturer that's based in Europe. And they're one of the biggest in the world and they're one of the best in the world. And on this, and they pay really well. So on the surface, your colleagues are like, oh my God, you got a commercial shoot for such, for such, you know, such and such. And in my head, I'm like, this sucks. Like, I don't want to do this. Yeah, the money's nice, but like I could care less about appliances and I don't really want to work with these people and I don't like this location and I don't like anything about this. And on and on the surface, everyone's like, oh, you got to shoot for them. Wow, that's really great. And in the background, I'm like, if I never do this again, it'll be too soon. 
<laughs> and so I knew I was like, I'm not destined for this. Same thing with advertising. I had a couple of really nice advertising shoots where the budgets on the surface were very, you know, we're talking six figure budgets and then a five figure shooting fee and licensing and all this stuff. And the whole time I was miserable. And I was like, I, this isn't even fun. And on, on the surface, people are like, wow, you just landed that advertising campaign. And I'm like, this is miserable. I don't want anything to do with this. And so that little inner voice was saying, why are you doing this? Why, why on earth? Go work at REI. I mean, you'd be happier and you'd probably be more useful helping people understand outdoor equipment than you would be making these pictures. And so that's ultimately why one of the reasons why I just walked away. All right. All right. The last, the last mistake. Um, I did not diversify my knowledge inside the creative industry. So again, I, until probably 2010, which sounds crazy, 2010 was the first time I started looking around at the design community, at the illustration community, at the art world, at the street art world. I didn't know anything about street art. I thought those people were like, ah, they never want to talk about their work. They're like isolationists and they're difficult. I couldn't have been more wrong. I was just like, oh my God, what have I been doing? So I, I didn't do that until 2010. And 2010 was the second time and the last time, the permanent time that I quit photography. And so I was like, all right, I'm not going to be a photographer anymore. And I'm just, and with the blur, and really I have to blame blur for this blur exposed me to all these people. And I was down in Australia and I went to a festival called analog digital which is every, I think they do it every year or maybe every two years based out at the time it was based out of Brisbane and the founder, Matt is just awesome. He's this young Aussie guy that's super talented as a designer and he created this festival and there, and I went to a second creative festival called semi-permanent and these were short, like one or two day, very intensive creative professional um, events that had very little to do with photography, but they had everything to do with the industry of creativity itself. So there was photography, there was magazines, there were designers, illustrators, artists, and street artists. And so all of a sudden, as a photographer, I'm thrown into this, this creative festival. There's a thousand people in attendance you know, the halls are packed and I'm up giving a talk about photography and the next person like monster children magazine was there. Uh, you had all these famous street artists that had come in. And my first thought was, I am such an idiot. Like, how did I miss these people and this, these industries? Because we're all connected. All of them are connected. And I was again, like, Oh, just going to do this. Just going to push the button all the time. Just going to make pictures all the time. And I, you got in, I got into that crowd at Analog Digital and Semi Permanent, and I, again, I was kind of like, I'm probably the least interesting person here. Um, this is these folks are like turning my head inside out, and so that was another major mistake that I did not diversify inside. When we talked earlier, I talked about being more than a photographer in your personal life. Yes, you know, whether, whatever it is you do in your personal life, but also internally in the creative space, professionally. Um, for example, I'm doing this, this zine collaboration, AG 23, and the, my collaboration partner is beyond clothing out of Seattle and beyond has two or three people. And I, I only know a few people at the company. I know the director, and then I know some of their art department folks. And when I talk to them in the art department, I feel like the guy who doesn't know anything. I feel like the guy who didn't prepare for the test because <laughs> they're, they're referencing things. And I'm like, I don't know what that is. I don't know who that is. I don't know about that print process. I don't know about that's color separation. I don't know this and that. And I'm like, God, I have so much homework to do. Yeah. I know about photography. I know how to make good pictures if I've been given the chance to do it, but there is so much more to know. And Holy cow, look at what I do for a living with blurb. Yeah in terms of knowing software and color space and page design and typography and all these things that I just ignored for almost 30 years, I somehow found a way to ignore this stuff and not smart. Well, Dan, that's a good roundup. We have some questions coming our way. Let's, let's uh, hit into some of those. Jared. Yeah. We have we've got a good from, one here. Yeah. Go for it. Um, so we've got one from a viewer, uh, and they want to know, do you find working on assignments for photo competitions something worthwhile? Um, I've never been on an assignment for a photo comp. I, I think maybe they probably just think like making that a project. Like, so working on 
something for. So do you think that photo competitions are something that's worthwhile to work on, basically? Yes and no. So short answer is yes and no. There are what I would call legitimate photo contests, and there's a lot of contests that I personally consider to be nothing more than money grabs. So when you're, when you're thinking about a contest, uh, what you want to look at is who is putting the contest on, what is the fee, who are the judges, and that, let's face it, there's a lot of people judging these sort of pseudo photo contests who have no real credibility in the industry. And when you're paying whatever it is, 25 or 50 bucks per submission, and the judges are nobody you've ever heard of, and the last thing you want to look at is what are the prizes and what happens to your work? What kind of, whose eyes are going to see that work? And you have legitimate contests. And back when I started in photography, there were about four total contests. Pictures of the Year, World Press Photo, Communication Arts, and um, you know maybe another one I can't remember. But that was it. And then all of a sudden, these organizations realized how much money was out there and how many prosumer photographers were willing to pay 50 bucks to enter their work. And it suddenly went from four contests to 400 contests. And most of them are like contests I've never heard of. I don't know the judges. There are, I'll give you, I'll give you an example of what I think is a good contest. And that is Lens Culture out of, and I'm not sure if Lens Culture is based out of Paris or Amsterdam or both. But Jim oh, Casper. Yeah, Jim Casper is the founder of Lens Culture. Now, the reason I'm telling you about Lens Culture is I met Jim Casper in Amsterdam probably 10 or 11 years ago. And I really liked him and I like Lens Culture and they've gotten better and better and better. So a couple of years ago, on a whim, I'm like, I'm going to enter a Lens Culture contest and just see what it's like so that I can tell you what a good contest is. So I enter this and like an idiot, I'm doing this like normal. I'm doing a hundred things at once and I enter and I entered a portrait, a group of portraits, portraits I'd done. And I accidentally entered in the singles category instead of in the, in the story catalog, in the story portion of the contest. But here's what happened. I enter it and I had to pay a fee and I cup, I don't know, whatever time goes by and lens culture reaches out and the person who reaches out is the individual professional photographer who looked at my work in particular and she wrote me this unbelievable recap of the work that i had done each image and this was legitimate feedback like this was professional feedback and she said to me if you hadn't screwed up basically and entered in the singles and you'd have, if you'd have entered this in the story, you might've actually done really well in this contest, but like you can't go anywhere now because you've entered these as individuals instead of a story. And I could care less about winning the contest. I was really impressed by what I got as a participant. I was like, this is legitimate professional feedback that you would have had to pay to go to like a portfolio review yeah. to get this. And the number of people and like where those images would end up and the people that saw them in my head, I'm like, that's a legitimate contest. But so many of what I see are just, they're just money grabs. They're just people saying, Hey, we can get prosumers. Here's the other indicator. If you're a prosumer photographer and there's absolutely nothing wrong with being a prosumer, if you enter, let's say the portrait category and the person who wins is a full-time professional photographer who shoots eight by 10 portraits of celebrities, then you got, in my opinion, you got scammed. Yeah, you got stung there. They took your money, but they knew all along you were never gonna win. They were gonna give it to the celebrity portrait photographer because if you put a celebrity on the cover of the contest, more people are gonna look at it. They've been running this scam for years, I yeah. think. That to me is like, so you have to be careful. I do think contests can be helpful, but it just depends on which one. We're going to run and some so ourselves. Guessing, oh, yeah. We ha we actually have one coming up. We're going to be giving away some prints, but that's a legit one that you should enter in. And by the way, it looks like got to go. Uh, I assume that was directed to me. You want to buy me a cup of coffee in Carmel anytime? Just let me know. <laughs> it may not be coffee. I don't drink a lot of coffee after 10 a.m. Might be a cup of mint tea, but. Hey, that just, works. I, the Moroccans, I'm, I'm the Moroccans know something we don't. Moroccan they love the mint tea. Okay, listen, you guys, we got any other questions? You've got Dan, the man, right here. He's ready to answer. Fire away. So, you know, um, 
Dan, this whole point about the mistakes and learning from them is super important because yeah. if we don't, we're we're just fools, right? I mean, you know, like you said, you could enter into a contest, find out it's bogus. Doesn't mean you never enter into a contest, but it just means you check it out and make sure that it's legit and it's Yeah, you, you do your research. You know, you look yeah. at who won the year before and you look at what what happened to that work, what people saw it, what the feedback was, what the fee is, what the you know, I think Lens Culture runs like four major contests a year. Um, and that's a pretty good gauge. And I, I think too, like world press photo and, and pictures of the year, I think those are still going on, but for most people who don't work as pros, they're not going to enter those contests. And so I don't really know the, uh, the legit contest anymore. Cause I don't spend a whole lot of time looking. I haven't, I mean, I, that's not a personal goal of mine to enter a contest. So I don't really pay attention to them, but I do know lens culture is the one that I personally investigated. Okay, here we have a question from Kamal, self-publishing versus the traditional route. I've got answers to that, but go ahead, Dan. Wow, that's a complex question. Uh, depends on the project and depends on who you are and what your goals are. I think there yeah. are people who are there are people who are very well prepared to self-publish, and there are other people who get rejected by traditional publishers and out of frustration or anger, they end up trying to self-publish, and that never seems to work well. Self-publishing requires a set of ingredients that some of you have and some of you probably don't have. I think traditional publishing, I love traditional publishing, when the deal is right. Um, the primary deal I see these days is photographers putting anywhere from 20000 to 50000 of their own money up front to get a book deal. Yeah. The vast, vast, vast majority of the time, they do not see a penny of that money back. Um, having said that, it can still be a good strategic business move to do a book like that. Although I had a conversation with a photographer yesterday who did a book and was so had such a miserable experience. Actually, the twice in the last week, I've had the same conversation with two different photographers who did books with traditional publishers and the experience was so miserable. They said, I will never do this again. I'm going to figure out how to self publish. Um, there is, uh, again, there are people out there who are doing this self publishing really well. Now that the upside of self pub is that you can often do a very personal book yeah. that may or may not work for a traditional publisher because of their economics and, and the market and what they think they can sell. And you can also typically do a self-published book much quicker than you can with a traditional publisher. Most of the time, they're 12 to 18 month publishing cycles. However, traditional publishers can often do some things that most people can't. For, for example, they have a design team. Exactly an acquisitions editor, they have a marketing department, they work with distributors, um, they do a lot of things. However, more and more people are doing this on their own. And it's pretty fascinating to watch this happen because a lot of the best books I see now are printed in very small numbers. They're done, they're self-published, um, and they're, they're absolutely fantastic. So you just have to know, do you know how to market? Do you have distribution? Um, all those things, it's and complicated. What is Exactly. And having access to the team, like you said, you have designers, editors, etc. But you, you definitely there's pros and cons. Check it out. We could do a whole show on this. I should on for sure. The ins yeah, and outs of publishing should because, yeah, there is there. It's a very complicated. Everyone tries to make it seem simple. It's not whether you it go isn't. traditional or or self. It's it is a marriage. You're basically marrying yourself to this project and it can be really overwhelming. Let's uh, take one more question. I will mention this is coming up here. Got to go is saying you want professional feedback tomorrow. Uh, I'll mention it right now. Uh, Bob Holmes is going to be on the show. He's actually doing a shoot in Walla Walla, Washington, so he won't be joining us. So tomorrow I'm going to do some critiquing. Post your stuff on the AYP Club and let me know if you want it critiqued or not, because I'm not going to critique on the air if you don't want it. But post in there. Jared, put the link. Just you guys uh, put your work in there tomorrow. We'll do that. I'm also going to talk. You kind of inspired me, Dan. I'm going to talk about five of my own personal favorite mistakes I've made. But that's tomorrow. So you can get critiqued. Let's take one last question. I saw one flying by there, Jared. What was that? Uh, uh, there's a couple different ones, uh, but I think 
Uh, the other one would be, let me find it. Here it is. So somebody wanted to, you know, learn about the beginnings of printing from home and from a mobile device, they said. Yep. Yeah, I mean, printing at home, Yeah, there's a lot of companies who make good printers, Canon, Epson. I'm sure there's other brands out there as well. You don't need anything big. You don't need anything fancy. I mean, even printing four by sixes, five by sevens, uh, totally fine. And with your mobile device, I mean, now you can probably get Bluetooth um, where you don't even need to connect. You could just use your mobile device and fire them over Bluetooth to your printer yeah. and bang them out. And so that's easy. And and the range of papers available through Canson and Hanamule and these companies, are it's just endless. There's actually, in my opinion, too many paper types. That's one of the hardest uh one of the hardest things to do is to differentiate between surfaces and textures and weights. And it just takes a lot of testing. But when you're buying little packs of four, six or five by seven, it's not super expensive. And really what that printing makes you do, especially with a mobile phone, because everybody's out just like banging away on their phone all day long, is it forces you to make decisions about what's actually good. And it forces you to edit. That's what print does with regardless of how you're doing it. Whether you're making making a book or a magazine or a single print, you have to stop for a second and go, okay, I shot 30 pictures of that buffalo in Yellowstone. Which one's the best? And so you have to apply critical thought to your work to figure out what's good or not. And that's super helpful. What I would do is kill two birds with one stone. I would buy either the Canson postcard paper or the Hanamule postcard paper and I would I would print and I would make postcards and email them or not email them but mail them out to your friends and uh, and see what happens I do it all the time and it's um, one of the most rewarding things I do is to send things out in the mail you know it's just a great idea to print and as you pointed out earlier in the show even if you're doing it with a cruddy printer and you put it in your your journal you've printed something yeah. and it has a different feel right yeah, this this print was done with my with a it's an all in one scanner copier that I have probably had for ten years, and it was not good when I bought it, and it's still not good. <laughs> but and this is notebook its paper. Purpose. Yeah, yeah, it's notebook paper. It's fine. I use a glue stick. I stick it in there. I move on, and it's great. Boom, Dan. We're gonna wrap up. We've taken a lot of your time. Thank you for your mistakes. We'll gather some more, and. No Listen, always good to have you on the show, my friend. Yeah, you too. Jared, thanks for everything. And Mark, we'll talk soon. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. All right, thanks. And you guys, adios, adios amigo. So, uh, yes, as I just mentioned, tomorrow will be a special show. Put your uh, prints in the AYP Club. Make sure you tag them. I don't want to uh, critique something you don't want critique, but... Go ahead and tag it. Just say, you know, critique on it. You can put a hashtag on it if you want. You don't have to. And we'll take those up tomorrow, okay? Tomorrow at 10 a.m. My critiques, I follow uh, what I said in the AYP Club. I will pick one thing that I think if you, if I see something you need to improve, I'll pick one thing. I'll, I'll definitely point out what I see is right about it. But rather, I don't pick things apart and say, well, you, you should change this and this and this. But I'll just I'll give you straight, you know, the straight scoop. I'm not going to hold anything back. If I see it, I'll tell you what it is. And I hope that helps you. That's my whole intention with uh, a critique. Yeah, got to go. You can just put critique. Yeah, critique. Um, that's, that's another thing that we'll do, uh, if you have if you've been putting a lot of photos up, uh, something that we can do. I'm going to put a post up that will announce this. Oh, that's a good idea. And you could just comment and say, if, if you want, you could just say, hey, just use any of my photos if you want. Yeah. And so that way, then uh, I might look through your your backlog of photos that you've put up and I might pick one or two. Jared's um, going to be that... running that part of it. I'm going to let you just pick, pick your photos and I will yep. tell you what I see and we'll move along. We'll try to get as many so... done as we can, okay? Yeah, so if you only want some of your photos, then you can put like hashtag critique or uh, something. And then if you are fine with all of them, just comment on the post that I'll be putting up shortly and just say, hey, use any of my photos that you want. So I, I'm looking forward to this because, wow, you guys put such amazing photos up. Uh, I'm always so impressed when I see sometimes I share them with some friends or family 
Uh, and they're always like, man, are these professional photographers? And some, you know, some are, but not, not all of you are professional photographers, but they sure think that you're professional photographers when they see your work. Okay. Well, tomorrow's your opportunity. Let you guys know on Tuesday, Jan and I are hitting the road for about two and a half weeks. We're going to Montana. We're going to go to Yellowstone. Uh, we're going to go to Three Forks. We're going to probably head over to Sun Valley. We're going to head over to the coast, uh, come down the coast, hit the redwood trees. I'm going to be bringing my various cameras with me. I'm going to try to broadcast from the road. It'll be totally different than what you're doing, what you're seeing now, because I'm just going to turn on my iPhone and start talking. Also, uh, I'm going to make a lot of Instagram stories. So if you haven't already started following me, do so because I'm going to make a lot of little stories as I go. And that's kind of fun, you know, 15 second little updates from here and there, and wherever. Um, so that's what's happening. And uh, starting very soon, I'm going to start giving away Advancing Your Photography. This very book right here uh, will be available to you guys for free. You just got to cover the postage. That's starting any minute, practically. We're just kind of wrapping up a few things on that. But take a look for that. If you already have a copy of it, you could get one for a friend or you could have a friend get it. Um, I want to get these books out. I want you guys using them. I'm going to do that with all my books, by the way. So we're starting with advancing your photography. Then I'll get into uh, composition and create. I'm going to do that with all four of my books coming your way soon. Okay, well, I think that's about it. You guys, I want you along with me on my travels. So stay tuned, both on YouTube and Instagram Live. Uh, and who knows where else things might show up. I'm so happy to ha be, you know, working with you guys. I love working with you. I love bringing you guests. I love, you know, connecting you with these amazing photographers. And as you can see in today's show, it's a lot more than just photography. It's about life itself, right? I think that's it. So will you guys uh, make sure if you haven't already done this, subscribe. It really means that you're connected up with us. You're going to see all our new shows. Enable the bell so you get notified, especially because I'm going to be doing these YouTube lives. I'm not always going to be able to give you advance warning. So enable the bell so you get notified. Share, like, leave your comments. I really, truly do try to answer all your questions. And... Last but not least, say it along with me now. <laughs> say it with me. You know what I'm going to say. Remember to get out and capture your own images of life. That's what it's all about. Okay, friends. See you soon. Love you. Take care. Stay well.